Hello everybody, I am Shivali Agarwal. Welcome to my session in SERI 2020. I am going to talk about automatic microservice candidate identification from monolith applications, which is an ongoing work uh, at IBM Research India, along with my collaborators Shrikant, Ronak, Utkarsh and Amit. Industries have these legacy applications which are monoliths, which means that all the functionality is packaged together and for any small update, the whole application needs to be deployed. Now, as you can see, this means that the speed of deployment gets very slow. Any small change of small feature rollout itself needs a lot of plan and a release cycle. So the industry wants the legacy applications, which are monoliths, to be modernized to a more agile microservice architecture, which can enable them leverage the benefits of DevOps, container orchestration, and fast feature rollouts. Additionally, this also helps them in their cloud journey. So increasingly, as we know that more and more enterprises want to adopt the cloud platforms because of the benefits of cost and ease of management of resources that it brings along. So the customers are increasingly taking up the modernization of their legacy applications to a microservice architecture, which is a very natural fit to the cloud platform. While the enterprises want to move their monolith to microservices architecture, the refactoring of the applications quickly, cheaply, and optimally into a microservices architecture is a major challenge that they face today. Such refactoring tends to be very time consuming and laden with business risks because of the scarcity of automation tools that can effectively automate the design of target microservices architecture. While there is a scarcity of automation tools, identifying microservice candidates as an area of research has been pretty active since last few years. Let us take a look at some of the approaches that have been tried in the literature. People have studied this problem from various lenses and we have listed the main ones uh, on the slide. The most important uh, and perhaps the most intuitive way that people have studied this problem is trying to understand the functional decomposition of the uh, monolith application by using the names uh, and the structures uh, and the code structure. So the, the idea is that the method name, variable name or class name, they typically they hide the functional intent uh, of uh, the application and if we can group the names that are uh, similar then we can actually come up with clusters of uh, functionality that are present in the application. Similarly there is another uh, line of work which analyzes the code structure using static or dynamic analysis. So here the idea is that the uh, the invocations between methods and classes, uh, if we capture those uh, through a graph representation and then cluster them, then the, the ones that occur together or that get grouped in, uh, in, in, a, in a cluster will probably denote the functionality that is being uh, carried out by the application. While these are very uh, intuitive and useful techniques, there is a flip side to them. So for, for one, uh, when we take the case of functional names, then there is no guarantee on the quality of names. Similarly, the structure-based clusters need not denote functional boundaries. And that's where many a times we may end up with natural seams, which are actually not very representative of the functional boundaries. Another way that people have studied uh, the decomposition of monoliths is through version control systems. So they study the change logs, commit history, source code, and try to group the files which have the tendency to be committed together or where the changes happened uh, together. 
the idea being that if something if some functionality uh, is impacted then probably the files that are committed together will also uh, belong to that functionality uh, some of the flip sides for this uh, particular approach is that logs traces and version control history may not be available at desired granularity another interesting approach is transaction context based which is applicable for applications written using MVC paradigm. The idea is that uh, the core uh, functional entities will be invoked mainly through the controller classes and uh, all the uh, entities that are invoked together uh, through in, in the same controllers should be, uh, uh, should be placed in the same uh, microservice candidate. So here, uh, uh, this, is a, this is quite a promising approach, except that it's applicable only to uh, MVC paradigm applications. And the number of clusters uh, is an input. So how many functional boundaries or how many functionalities are there in your application is something which is an unknown and which has to be provided as an input. Then there are other approaches uh, which use uh, different uh, inputs like BPMN use cases, open API specifications, reference vocabulary, etc. So, uh, so we'll uh, cover the interface definition based uh, approach as uh, probably another interesting one, where uh, the co-location of terms in your open API specifications are used to infer the microservice candidates. While uh, uh, this, is, uh, uh, th this can lead to very clean results, the limitations is that it depends on a very well-defined interface and a reference vocabulary, which may not always be available to us. We saw on the previous slide that there are many approaches that can be adopted to analyze and decompose a monolith uh, to move towards a microservices architecture. However, we also saw that each one of the approaches had their own set of limitations and it was it was not very clear as to if there is a clear winner or there is a clear cut approach that can be adopted uh, in a very generalized manner so there are so so the challenges that industries and the enterprises face uh, are many for one there is no one right solution for breaking an application to microservices as we just saw and the cognitive stress in consuming multiple approaches output is, is very high. The multiple approaches might often lead to contrasting partitions, thereby consensus is very hard to arrive at and thereby increasing the stress. That's, that's one type of challenge. Then the other type of challenge is in the type of inputs that are needed by these approaches. In many of the approaches that may, quite, that may be quite promising, clients may not be ready to give access to their application runtime or maybe uh, to the source control version and so on and so forth. Uh, to add on to this, uh, to these set of challenges, very few metrics are there to support the recommended partitions. As we saw on our slide above, that most of the metrics that are used are related to clustering quality, which is related to cohesion, coupling, silhouette scores, and so on. So these, these, all these things uh, together make up this task of identifying the microservice uh, candidates, a very Herculean task. With this landscape in mind, we embarked on a journey of coming up with a solution for microservice candidate identification. We had very strong design considerations chalked out uh, at the outset. It was very clear to us that our a solution has to be guided by business functionality and not the structural properties of the code. As we have also mentioned earlier, that structural properties based clustering need not always give us functional boundaries. Then we also were very sure that uh, our solution should be able to handle different types of framework. So the la logic cannot be determined by one type of application pattern. For example, we cannot have a solution designed only for MVC type of applications. We also uh, wanted to uh, ensure that the input to our solution 
can be a binary file and it uh, need not be a git repo source code and we should be able to work with limitations uh, that are there in a practical scenario when we don't have access to all the db tables or the uh, source code commits and so on so so we had uh, a clustering approach that we wanted to design that should be guided by functionality queues while honoring the structural properties. So how to find the functional queues? As we have seen that the name based approaches that is there in the literature is not dependable because of the varying quality of source code. Tables by themselves also cannot determine function boundaries without considering the way in which they are accessed. How about choosing the entry point classes? They may again be designed badly and may contain all entry points in one class. We have to rely on the entry point methods and the call flow through business logic classes to infer classes that can act as functional queues. However, that's a large set and we need to be able to choose the most representative classes for a functional boundary. We now pictorially present the problem of finding functional boundaries that we are trying to solve using functional queues and code structure properties. The blue circles and ovals that you see here, they represent the source code properties that we have inferred using various static analysis techniques. The main abstractions that we have arrived at using our analysis are grouped into three parts namely entry points, business logic and resources. Entry points work as our functional queues because if you really think then the monolith uh, application must have exposed its entry points uh, based on the functionality that it wanted to provide. The business logic is the core uh, uh, area or the core packages, files uh, of the application which consists of domain entities, uh, various uh, 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 rules, business rules, uh, and so on. And these business logic files will interact at the backend with resources like DB tables, files, and so on. So we extract these uh, three core uh, uh, source code uh, and uh, uh, source code properties, and then we try to use the functional queues thus arrived at along with the structural flow to infer the business functional boundaries which you see on the leftmost uh, orange circle. So here uh, the, uh, the, the definition for the functional boundary is that the functional boundaries induced by entry points for an application uh, are the logical cuts that can group the business logic classes such that the responsibilities for each group are as mutually exclusive as possible. So the functional boundaries effectively overlay over the uh, structural flow using the functional queues. The key difference between our approach and the transaction context based approach is that we uh, can infer the number of functional boundaries and that does not need to be given as input to us. In this slide we show how our approach works from uh, the binary or the source code all the way to identify microservice candidates. The input to uh, our approach as you can see is an EAR or a WAR file or it could be a git repo which is then passed through a variety of uh, static analysis techniques to arrive at the service entry mappings, which is basically the entry points uh, that we spoke of earlier, the method call graph, and the access to resources. As you can see in this, uh, in this case, we have shown DB access that we infer from the analysis. Once we have the service entry points and the CRUD actions and the, the business uh, uh, files, the flows information, we apply formal concept analysis, uh, which is an existing work, to find the business logic classes that capture distinct functional information as required for finding functional boundaries. This is the key step which helps us uh, understand the number of functions that are being implemented in the application. Once 
we have identified the key functional classes using formal concept analysis. We use this information for clustering. Clusters are formed with these classes acting as the central member and the other classes are pulled into each of the cluster based on the inter-class usage pattern. Having provided an overview of how we leverage various source code properties to arrive at the functional understanding of the code of the application, we now present uh, we, uh, the results on two public applications. Uh, that we ran through using our approach. The first one is a very well known uh, application Day Trader, which has been used widely for uh, demonstrating uh, the effectiveness and the results of uh, various of, of uh, uh, such decomposition approaches. Here you can see uh, that uh, on the right hand side where we have marked this box as functional uh, clusters. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a very interesting result where we can see that we have been able to identify most of the functional uh, clusters uh, quite cleanly. For example, we have been able to identify uh, a cluster that belongs to account profile. Then there is a cluster that maps to portfolios. Then there is a cluster which gives a market summary. Uh, and then there is another cluster which uh, which tries to configure the database, which is uh, something of an internal application uh, function. So this is quite a promising result, and uh, and it clearly shows that we have been able to successfully identify the functional boundaries using our approach. We now present uh, another application which is called Plants by WebSphere, which is an uh, which is an e-commerce application which involves ordering, cart management, catalog, and so on. Here also if we see, uh, we have marked the functional clusters that we have identified uh, on the right hand side. Uh, and here we can see that we have been able to um, quite uh, uh, nicely segregate the functional responsibilities uh, of the classes. Uh, we can see that we have been able to identify inventory uh, and back order in one cluster, then the account and customer management in another cluster. Uh, we have also been able to identify catalog management uh, as another cluster. So overall this approach looks quite promising and uh, in the two uh, public applications that we have applied it, uh, it has resulted in good results. We are in the process of evaluating our results uh, uh, in more depth and we are also trying to uh, apply more metrics to uh, compare it with the existing approaches. With this we conclude our talk. Uh, thanks a lot for your time and hope you enjoyed it.